This is North Pod, a North Melbourne fan podcast, hosted by Jason Hunt. Nick Stevenson with his own moves. Cannington, North are in front. Hello and welcome back to North Pod once again. The season is officially upon us now. We are just a couple of days away from round one. If you are listening to this on release, we are got GWS coming up in the next couple of days on Saturday. So uh, it's finally here. We have had the start of the season for a couple of the teams that played over the weekend. But, you know, the real stuff doesn't start until uh, this weekend. So... Super excited to talk about that, talk about the team, uh, a little bit of news and stuff to get through, and then we are straight back into regular podcasting, so super, super excited for the season to finally start. It does feel like it's been a long time and since the uh, last time we did a proper game review all the way back in August of last year, so plenty to talk about. Just the usual reminder, follow me on all the social media, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, etc. at North Pod Show for most things. I think I'm just on TikTok as North Pod. And a reminder, if you'd like to support the show, you can buy me a coffee or a vanilla Coke. Uh, you can find the link for that in the show notes. I'll give you a shout out in the episode for any contributions. And I really appreciate any contributions. I do have a couple of reviews to read out. Uh, Let me find that page. Here we are. So I've had two reviews since I I last posted. Uh, So thank you to E equals MC3 or Cubed uh, for the five-star review. And thank you to Like the Blank Screen for for the reviews. Appreciate um, some really kind words in those reviews, which was um, really nice. As, As always, I feel like... Those reviews are written as though um, they're almost written directly to me because they just speak directly to what I to what I try to bring to the show. So I do appreciate uh, the balance and the focus and and what people are taking out of the podcast. And I hope that we can spread a bit of balance uh, with with hopefully some optimism this year. So yeah, if you would like to have yourself read out on the show, um, drop me a review on Apple Podcasts. I really appreciate it. And any review or rating on any podcast service is much appreciated. Yeah, let's let's talk about this episode. We'll talk briefly about the Giants at the end, but that is our opposition for round one. Uh, and most of this podcast, we've got a couple of housekeeping items in terms of news and things in the week to talk about, and I will have a look, just like any good podcast, I'll have a look at my personal best 23 going into round one and talk a little bit about how I came up with that. I'm sure by now you've probably heard the same 25 or so names being thrown around, so no massive surprise, I don't think, but uh, oh, actually, yes, there's a massive surprise, so st- stick around for that massive surprise uh, later on in the pod. Let's whip through the discussion points from the week. Because I'm a little bit late, I did start to get this out um, either during the long week, weekend or just after. We are falling into the just after category, um, which was fortunate for me because today, which is Tuesday as I record this, uh, it was confirmed to us or through social media and the press conference that Zane Dersma and Colby McKercher will debut. Uh, in round one, so on one hand makes my round one side a little bit easier, but I think it's fantastic they've taken the pressure off those boys early on in terms of the build-up, um, get that out of the way now, get the accolades and the excitement out of your system, and then that just allows them to prepare as properly as you ever can for your first AFL game uh, in the coming days. I'm sure you know probably Thursday their attention can really turn to you know what, what they need to do in round one, so... Fantastic to hear that. Um, I think it was pretty obvious or pretty evident that um, McKerch was going to debut. And I thought, just based on the way that Dersma played last week against St Kilda, uh, I thought, yeah, that really cemented in my mind the fact that he was he was going to debut and, and play early. So um, I was a little bit, I wasn't sure just based on his profile. But that being said, you also do hope that if you're if you're picking a player in the top sort of five of the draft that's not a key position player or a ruckman, ideally you'd love them to be playing pretty early on in the year. They're typically the more ready-made type players, the mids, 
or the the smaller to medium players, and, and Dersma does fit into that category. But that being said, he is quite slight for his for his height. Um, anyway, I think it's a fantastic opportunity to get him in, and you know maybe he doesn't play every week. Maybe we give him a stint, and if he's a bit out of form, we can send him back to the VFL and he can find some form. But and that's okay, you know he's he's young. It's a really hard position to, to play sort of medium tall forward. Um, and yeah, he's he's got, done a fantastic job in, in the preseason. But, you know, if, if his form or the rigors of AFL football get to him, I'm sure I'm sure there'll be no one judging him to, if he goes back to the VFL to find some form. And the Kirch, yeah, I mean, he I thought that his game against the Saints was probably his worst preseason game. But prior to that, he, he looked pretty impressive. So... He's another ball user off halfback. I'll talk about him in more detail a little bit later. But uh, fantastic that the two of them will debut. And just, yeah, as I said, takes the pressure off them. Another thing that came up, really it was late last week, uh, and I didn't talk too much about it in the podcast last week because I do try to keep the off-field, non-footy stuff to a minimum. It's just... To be perfectly honest, it's just not as interesting to me, and there are times where you have to, like you couldn't completely avoid the Taron Thomas talk, but I did try to limit it and keep it football-based where I could. Uh, So obviously we had the the Jai Simkin hit from Jimmy Webster, and I did did talk about that. Something that I didn't really mention was the Alistair Clarkson spray that um, he gave Webster and, and Howard at quarter time. As a result of that, um, Clarko's copped a $20,000 fine and a suspended two-game ban for his derogatory comments towards the Saints players. Um, it's really not worth repeating on the podcast, but essentially, as I said, he's got a $20,000 fine, and if he reoffends in the next two years, then that suspended two-game ban will be applied. I'm not really sure... Um, in terms of reoffend, the specifics of what that means, like in what realm he, his reoffending would that would apply for? Um, maybe it's the giving. Uh, sorry, maybe it's the bringing the game into disrepute. Like perhaps he has to reoffend in that realm. Let's hope it doesn't happen. But yeah, that's that's what he was given. From my perspective, uh, I know all my loyal listeners will have been waiting for my opinion on this matter. Um, I think it's great to defend your players. There's better ways to do it. Um, it doesn't functionally achieve anything. And yeah, personally, I, I just think it's needless. I get it. He's an emotional man. And I think part of what makes him a fantastic coach is how competitive he is. But I, it's just, it's what we get from him. You know, he's got history in this area. You know what you're going to get from him. And uh, he was questioned today by the media around whether or not he's going to change. And I think... To be honest, he was quite honest. He he kind of dodged the question because I don't think he's going to change in that way. He's a really fiery and emotional man. That's part of what makes him a great coach. But at times, he's going to overstep the line. And I think, yeah, I think the club knew what they were getting into when they took him on. Obviously, he's a fantastic football brain, but there are some unfortunate circum uh, not circumstances what's the word i'm looking for this is great podcasting some unfortunate consequences um that come with that at times so yeah i would hope that i think it's an appropriate ban uh, or a, i think it's an appropriate sanction uh and i wouldn't be surprised if he did reoffend in some way to be honest but i hope he doesn't let's move on there's just no value in getting caught up in the media back and forth. I've seen some talk on social media around, you know, the media having it in for Clarko slash North Melbourne. I just let it go. <laughs> if you, if any of those people are listening to me, I'm sure they're not. Um, but I wouldn't worry about it. Like, let's worry about what we can control. You can't control the media. We can control how we react to it. So hopefully Clarko can um, stay between the, the lines for the for now and stay out of trouble and we can we won't have to worry about this kind of stuff um, because it's just yeah it's it's not what we go to the football for on to brighter topics I did put out a bit of a call out last week for suggestions for what I should call the the player of the year for North pod uh, or how I should term it and thank you to Glenn lavender who's a um, loyal listener of the show regular contributor. Thank you for the suggestion, re the Player of the Year Award. So they've suggested, and it looks fantastic in text, the North 
podium slash podium. Um, so I, I haven't landed perfectly on how I'd like to say it because obviously technically it is a podium and that's where the play on words come from if you hadn't caught it. Um, but the podcast is called North Pod. So my my current strategy with going this is I'm just going to say it a bit faster and I think it kind of sounds like a mash between pod and pod. So on the North Podium today, and I'm just going to go with it and we're going to see how that works. <laughs> but look, I'm rolling with it. I think it's a fantastic idea. As Glyn pointed out, it kind of allows us to um, shout out who's on the on the podium um, at any given time, who's in that top three, and it potentially will shift as the year goes. Um, and you know we could also celebrate three at the end of the year rather than one. Um, so yeah, we're going to call it the North Podium, and maybe later in the year I just call it Podium or I call it Podium. <laughs> uh, if you've got a better suggestion, let me know. But also don't because I'm going with it. So um, yeah, thank you again. Glenn, that will start get that started as of uh, next week. The last bit of news or stuff to catch up on aside from the last bit of news to talk about, I, I think it probably will be a shorter pod this week, but who knows by the time I'm finished with my round one team, it could be 90 minutes in. Um, the VFL side did have a practice match against the Dogs on Saturday. Really hot game. I'm sure any Melbournians would know it was a very hot weekend. So whilst they did start pretty early, I think at 10 a.m., it was pretty hot from the start of the day on Saturday. So super hot conditions. Um, The the team was able to win by 18 points, 74 to 56. In terms of AFL players, uh, as I said last week, like I did not watch the game. And when you read the uh, North Melbourne website review, it tends to be pretty positive. Uh, but it's hard to knock Hugh Greenwood's four goals. I think, um, yeah, I'll talk about him a little bit later, but he does give us a real option up forward. We know he rolled his ankle in the preseason, so that's part of why we haven't seen him. But I also think he's he's on the fringe, so he's, he's not a guaranteed walk-up spot. Uh, we know that he's been training in the forward line as that backup rock option. So, yeah, four goals. He's, he's hitting some form at the right time, and I, I think he's really pressing his his case for a round one spot. Hamish Free, who was um, playing his first footy for the year, I believe, or at least competitive footy, uh, kicked three goals as well, which is really great to see. I I think he's a fair way down the pecking order. I wouldn't expect to see him um, pulling on the jumper unless we're we're pretty desperate in terms of injuries. But uh, any any good form is good form. And, um, yeah, I mean, three goals. And it wasn't just Marky. He was pretty agile. He kicked two of them with more small small forward type craft. So, yeah, great to see that at least we've got another tall player in some form. And then, yeah, Archer, McDonald, Core, Combin, Taylor, Ford, and Goad all played. Um, and we know that, you know, a variety of those are in contention. Like Archer, it was his first competitive game, so he's not in contention for round one. Uh, it doesn't sound like McDonald will play either. Um, from what Clarko said today, it seems as though he's he's going to need some more time. I think Core and Combin are interesting because um, they're probably a little bit closer than McDonald is to playing, or at least being in contention. Uh, Eddie Ford, I, I don't know, I don't really have a read on how likely he is, but they're they're certainly in the frame. And then, yeah, I wouldn't say that Goad or uh, Curtis Taylor are likely. I mean, I really, it seems as though Curtis Taylor's way down the pecking order. And, and personally, for me, he is as well. And and we know that Taylor Goad's really in a in a development phase. So Greenwood and Cor, Ford, McDonald, Combin, they're the most likely. But I really think it's Greenwood, Ford, Cor, Combin that um, are pushing and it is interesting, I'll talk about it a little bit later, but there's so many of those defenders, that's where there's a real logjam for, for positions. So, yeah, any winning form in the preseason is good form, uh, and I think, yeah, good to get another win under the belt for the VFL side, but aside from that, I don't have a heap of insight um, because, as I say, I wasn't able to watch the game. So, yeah, you'll have to take the North Melbourne website's word for it in terms of their form. But let's get right into what we are, or what I'm thinking our round one team could be for my best 23. 
Now, I'll just give all the caveats and the context, and I'm sure when I post the picture on socials, um, I won't be able to give all those caveats. So hopefully you're listening to this if you've you know had a look at the picture because I will send it out so it's not a completely audio format. Um, I'm taking into account injuries and form. And obviously, when I say taking account into account injuries, there's a bit of guesswork there. So we know that Simkin's not going to play. We know that Griffin Logue's not going to play. And I am certain that uh, Jackson Archer's not going to play. Um, and then there are those kind of fringe injuries where, like McDonald, Core, Combin, um, are the, the type forward that we're not too sure about. So I'm, I've just made my best guess. Um, and really, it's just around, you know, if if most of those players were fit, uh, what would I do, I suppose, as, except for the ones that we know are out? Um, I will talk a little bit later around kind of what what I think the team should be like long term and look at like what it might look like when, when Griffin Logue is back, for example. Uh, but yeah, well, let's start with the, the round one side that I that I would personally pick. So I guess I'll just go lines. Um in the back line, I've got Zach Fisher, Callan Dawson, Toby Pink, Josh Goda, Aiden Kaur, and Harry Sheasel. And I will say that on the interchange, I've got Colby McKercher, who'd also be playing through the back line. So that, I guess, is my, my back seven. Um, I personally prefer Bailey Scott on the wing, but I would also say that if he's on the wing... Uh, he can rotate through halfback with someone like Sheasel or Fisher or Goda or McKercher. So plenty of options there. Um, but yeah, I mean, Fisher's, you, you'd have to pick him based off his preseason form. Um, Sheasel, we know, is definitely going to play. And I think by the looks of it, he's at least going to start in the back line. And again, why wouldn't you? I think Goda's game against the Saints really solidified the fact that he's a fantastic, flexible option. He's got a bit of height. He's a good kick. Um, so, yeah, he's definitely cemented his spot in that back six or seven for mine for sure. And then it was a bit tricky with, with the keys. So I think Callan Dawson is a definite. And then it's just, you know, is Aiden Core, Charlie Combin, are they available or which of them are available? Uh, so I prefer pink over Biggie Nguyen, and I've made a call that I think core as the more experienced defender, they might find a spot for him if he's fit. Now, obviously, if core's not available, then maybe they play Combin. If Combin's not available, maybe we're going back to Biggie Nguyen. Core and Combin are both up in the air, so it's hard to pick between them, but I've said I think that Callan Dawson gives you enough offensively and defensively that he's a an absolute lock. I think Toby Pink is the most defensive player in there, if that makes sense. He um, doesn't bring a lot offensively. He's solid, he's fine, but he's probably you know, about as useful offensively as Ben Mackay was. I think Callan Dawson provides a little bit more drive than that. Not a heap more, but a little bit more. He's a decent kick, he can run. He got, he's not bad for an overlapping hand pass on the way through. Um, and we've seen that Aiden Core. You know, whilst he can be a bit haphazard at times, he's also quite good offensively. And that's why I think I, with our game style, I really think you can only afford to have one complete lockdown defensively minded only player. So in my mind, at least for now, that's pink. And, you know, if you could replace him with Charlie Combin in the future, um, or if he is fit, I, I would do that because I think Common's going to give you more offensively than pink is. Um, so that's that's really my thinking. Biggie Nguyen didn't doesn't excite me from a one on one perspective. I, I think there's potential there. I, I do actually think there's a strong chance that he gets picked. Uh, I think potentially Clarko likes him more than I do. And let's be honest, what would I know? Um, but yeah, that that's my thinking. I really hope that Core's fit. But yeah, as I said, if he's if Core's not fit, then I think Biggie or Common get the the call up. But for me, the rest of it's pretty certain. I think Fisher go to Callan Dawson, Sheasel, and McKercher are certainties, and we know McKercher's a certainty. Uh, so it's really just pink and core that are my maybes. Um, and yeah, that, that's my back seven. I'll go to the forward line now. So same system. I've, I've picked seven forwards. So I've gone Jaden Stevenson, 
Hugh Greenwood, Zane Dersma, Paul Curtis, Nick Larkey, Cam Zerha, and then on the bench I've picked Cooper Harvey. And obviously the omission there is Callum Coleman-Jones, who I think, to be honest, I think he'll probably get picked for round one. But based on his form, I just think he needs to go back to the VFL and actually get some positive form, find his confidence again, um, get some touch, kick some goals, take some marks, all of those things, because he has just looked out of sorts in this preseason. He's looked, yeah, awful, to be honest. Unfortunately, I don't want to say that about a player of ours, but he's looked really out of sorts in the preseason. I think Hugh Greenwood's form, you know, kind of warrants selection, I've been on the record as saying I don't see Hugh Greenwood as a plan A or as a long-term solution, and I stand by that, but we actually don't really have an alternative aside from him for that that tall option, and I do think you need someone who can play backup ruck. To me, therefore, it makes sense that we, we pick Greenwood actually primarily as that backup ruck option. But, I mean, he's in goal-scoring form. He's going to play primarily midfield. We know he's a great tackler. He can go into the midfield just as a midfielder rather than a ruckman if need be. He's got a lot of flexibility. So that's my thinking with the Greenwood-Coleman-Jones matchup. As I said, I probably expect that Coleman-Jones will play, and I won't be super upset about it. I could see giving him a a chance at AFL level. But, um, yeah, personally, I think I'd go with Greenwood for a couple of games and, and just see what it looks like and... As I said, see if CCJ can find some form in the VFL. The rest of it, I feel, is is pretty straightforward. Like, Steve-O deserves his opportunity. He's been okay in the preseason. Uh, I mean, Larky, you know, go figure. He's he's going to be captain this weekend, almost certainly. Um, Zerha, you've got to pick him. Paul Curtis is interesting. I think he deserves first shot. And, um, you know, we, he, he played a fantastic game against Collingwood. I really... I think that he went missing against the Saints, and that's that's kind of been the knock on him in that he has those games where he doesn't bring a lot and he can fade in and out of matches. Um, but yeah, I think he deserves first crack. I think he's done enough historically that he should. And um, we know that he can bring a bit uh, defensively with his pressure. And um, yeah, we know that Zane Dersma is going to play, and I, th- I think he deserves to. He, he's had a fantastic preseason, and he just knows where the goals are, which is something that we need in this side. We need players who can hit the scoreboard because we know, aside from Larky, that's been a challenge um, the last couple of years. So having someone who, you know, at least in the pre- in the preseason games, has been good for a goal or two every game is, is super valuable, and we know he can mark it up forward as well. And then... Cooper Harvey as my seventh option. It's tricky because I wasn't really sure what to do. I could absolutely see just picking six forwards and then the midfielders are rotating through the forward line um, at times. But I don't know that a lot of our midfielders have that capacity. So I picked Cooper Harvey. I think of the the small forwards, he's had the best preseason. I think he's been better than Drury and Hanson Jr. And we know that he, he got a little bit of a look at it last year. I also just think, it kind of goes without saying here, but Simkin's injury is what's allowed Cooper Harvey into my personal side. Um, if Simkin's fit, then Simkin's in in place of Harvey and we're sort of not having this conversation. So, yeah, I've got Cooper in there because I think you you do need, with our current midfield look, I'd prefer to have a, a forward uh, to swap into the forward line because I don't think many of our midfielders can really be damaging through the forward line aside from Simkin. Um, so, yeah, I've, I've put Cooper Harvey there. I think he deserves the shot. And, yeah, we, we know what he needs to change. He needs to bring that, that forward pressure. That's what's been missing from his game. And then, finally, the, the, the midfield. So, I mean, it's pretty obvious. Dylan Stevens and Bailey Scott are on my wings. I've put George Wardler in the center position, but it really could be um, any of the mids in there. And then Tristan Jerry's the ruck. I'm so pleased for him that he's had a, a positive preseason, and I really hope he can bring that into the rest of the year. Uh, LGU, and I've got Will Phillips starting there. And then on the bench, I've got Powell and Lazaro. So obviously those two will also rotate through the midfield. 
And I think that you can kind of see now if those absolute midfielders are Powell, Lazaro, Wardlaw, and LDU, and Will Phillips, sorry. Like, none of those are super, super damaging options as forwards. Um, like Powell's probably the most acclaimed in that position, but none of them are known goal scorers. So that's why I've I've gone for balance with Cooper Harvey on the bench. Um, you know, we'll, we'll see how that goes. I'm I'm trying I'm Will Phil's my man this year, so I've I've put him starting, but honestly it just doesn't matter how you start them. LDU's gonna start. So aside from that, I feel like Wardlaw, Phillips, Paul Lazaro, whoever you, you pick to start on the bench, it doesn't really matter. Um and then yeah, obviously you could rotate Sheasel through the midfield. We could rotate Z- Zerha through the midfield, even though we haven't been in the preseason. Um you could put Greenwood through there in a pinch if you needed to. So there's definite options in terms of uh, the midfield there. And, uh, yeah, I think because of the couple of injuries we've got, uh, it allows all of those younger midfielders to play. I don't expect Powell, Lazaro, Phillips, all of them to make it long term. Um, but right now, if we can get them all on the side and, and have a really good look at them and develop them properly, uh, that'll give us the best the best chance. So yeah, it's just another one of those things with, with Taron Thomas coming out of the side. Uh, it, it gives one of those younger midfield options a go. And yeah, so just to reiterate that, because I sort of talked my way through it, Dylan Stevens and Scott on the wing and then Cherry Rucking, Wardlaw, uh, LDU, Phillips, Powell and Lazaro. Um, and two of those players are starting on the bench. And then finally, I've just was pretty tough to pick a sub. We won't actually know who the sub is anyway when the teams are announced, but I've put Darcy Tucker as the sub because uh, we know he's had quite the off-season, uh, or pre-season rather. He's, he's been in fantastic form according to the club. And whilst we didn't necessarily see it in the second half of the pre-season, I think there's a strong chance that, that they play him either as a sub or as a starting. And you could probably see that he, he could potentially play on the ground instead of someone like Cooper Harvey. So anyway, we'll wait and see, but I've put him as my 23rd player. In terms of those players that uh, have missed my my round one side, I've got obviously Griffin Lowe, Charlie Common, who's injury cloud, Biggie Newen, who is pretty close. Miller Bergman's on the outer at the moment. I'm not sure where he sits, but he hasn't been playing VFL either. There must be an injury there, but he's certainly on the outer. Luke McDonald, I have a feeling he is going to find his way back into the side. Well, it's obvious. I mean, he's, he's the co-captain. He will find his way back in. And I I wonder if that's through someone like McKerchell. McKerchell. That's the uh, wouldn't, that's a cross between McKerchell and, McKerchell and Sheasel. Um, I think one of those two, McKerchell or Sheasel, might need to move, say, up the ground into the wing or the, the midfield. And that would allow... Uh, Luke McDonald to play off half back, or potentially McDonald's going to play on off a wing because Bailey Scott's not playing on the wing. Like, there's a few things going through my head that I'm not super clear on, but it seems as though it's not really relevant at the moment because McDonald is unlikely to play. Uh, we know that Simkins unavailable. Eddie Ford, I think. Look again, I don't know. It's hard to make judgments on those injured players. I think if he's fit, he plays ahead of Cooper Harvey. Um, but yeah, I'm just not sure about his fitness for AFL level. Um, Coleman Jones, we've talked about, I think it's the form thing for him. And then Liam Shields is an interesting one because I've just got no read on whether or not we want to play, you know, a senior player like him this early in the year. Um, because he obviously would play a midfield or a wing role. So, you know, you could see him replacing someone like Cooper Harvey or, Tom Powell or Zaro or Phillips or Tucker, any of those types of players Shields could potentially play for. I personally would prefer only to see him when we get hit with some injuries and suspensions sort of in that middle part of the year when you tend to get a bit bogged down. Uh, but I could absolutely see that Clarko might want to play him for a bit of uh, maturity and, and age and um, experience. Uh, but yeah, I just personally think I'm playing Greenwood. I don't really want to play Greenwood and Shields in the same side. I think I'd just prefer to be giving a game to a younger player if I can. Um, so that is my best 
or my selected, what I would select as the 23. I'll just go through them one more time. Zach Fisher, Callan Dawson, Toby Pink, Josh Goda, Aiden Core, Harry Sheasel uh, in the back six. Dylan Stevens, George Wardlaw, and Bailey Scott across the middle of the ground with Tristan Jerry, LDU, and Will Phil uh, filling the middle. And then the forward line, Jaden Stevenson, Hugh Greenwood, Zane Dersma, Paul Curtis, Nick Larkey, Cam Zerha, front six. On the bench, uh, Colby McKercher, Cooper Harvey, Tom Powell, and Charlie Lazaro. And then I've gone with Tucker as the sub, but as I said, any of those five on the bench could potentially be a sub. You, you wouldn't think that McKercher would be the sub for his debut, though. Although, stranger things have happened. Um, in terms of, I kind of already talked about some of these points, so I'm just going to whip through them. That's my personal team. It's not necessarily the team that I am going to predict. I don't think it's, you know, super valuable to predict, to go through and then pr- do a whole new prediction for, for what I think round one will be. But I do think that CCJ is, is quite likely to be picked. Um, so I'm just putting that out there. I also think Biggie Newen is a strong chance to be picked over over Toby Pink or as well as Toby Pink if none of Core and Common um, are deemed fit enough. I, I do think that Tucker is probably more likely to, to play, like I mentioned. Um, and yeah, I think Shields is a good chance to play as well. So that's probably where I think that potentially my preferences or my ideas could, could differ from the clubs. But um, yeah, we'll wait and see. On Thursday, I guess, when the teams are announced, which is always an exciting point of the year. When I was doing this, I I also tried to have a look at, you know, if we ignore the injuries and we ignore current form, what we might expect that that best 23 or what personally I might expect the best 23 to look like. So I'm just going to speak to changes here. I think obviously Callan Dawson and Aiden Core are in our best 23 with Fisher, Goder, and Sheasel. I think, you know, that Toby Pink position just becomes Griffin Logue, personally. Now, what happens with Combin, I'm not sure. I still think that right now, Combin or CCJ are fighting it out for that other tall forward spot long-term. And who knows? I could be wrong, because Charlie Combin could have an absolutely elite year this year, and we, we don't think about moving him forward or removing him there. But we know that right now there's a big hole in our, our list because we do, other than Nick Larkey, we do not have a key forward that we can place our bets on. Like Tyler Sellers is speculative, let's be honest. CCJ is questionable at the moment. There's nothing else there. So um, long term, I do wonder if Common goes forward. If not, then potentially he becomes a preferred op- option over someone like Aiden Core. Um, but that kind of remains to be seen. And then I've put in, I'd say that Eddie Ford and Jai Simkin quite obviously are in our best 23. So they're in at the expense of players like Cooper Harvey um, and potentially Darcy Tucker. But there's not, you know, we're, we're pretty close to full fitness except for those um, couple of key defenders or defensive options really. Um so, yeah, I mean, my, my preferred long-term side is not that different. I, it's just that second key forward that I, I think is a bit of a worry for me, um, and I hope that it's a worry for um, the selectors and the, the list list management too. I hope that's something that they've they've got in the forefront of their mind because we seem to have lots of key defensive options now, even if we're not super sold on all of them. Uh, but that, that key forward, it's it's a challenge. I thought it would be interesting to have a look at how much this team has changed from the end of last year. So I I looked at our round 22 side. I didn't want to go right to the end where we kind of threw the threw the season away and we ended up winning that that round 24 game against the Gold Coast Suns. But I've just, I've gone through the list and here are some changes from that round 22 side which we played Essendon uh, and you might remember that one we we nearly won that one like like we nearly won several games last year. So of the players that played in that game, we know Aiden Kaur is in doubt. Ben Mackay has gone to Essendon. Jack Zeebel's retired. Taron Thomas is off the list. Luke McDonald's in doubt with injury. Curtis Taylor seems to be out of contention. Kane Turner's retired. Goldstein has gone to Essendon. Cunnington's retired. Simpkins currently injured. 
Archer is also injured, and Eddie Ford is under an injury cloud. So that's quite a group of players that are either definitely not going to be playing or are pretty uncertain. So the only players that I think are certain to play this coming weekend that also played in round 22 are Goda, LDU, Scott, Sheasel, Steve-O, Cherry, Larky, Curtis, and Wardlaw. And I would say that probables to play are Charlie Lazaro and Darcy Tucker. So that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 certainties and 11, uh, if I count the probables, which is half the team. So half a team's worth of change from round 22 last year to round 1. Now, I know that some of that is due to injury, but regardless, it's just it's a big shift and I think just goes to show how much we've transformed our list over the past 12 months. And even if you go back further than that, the past 24 months, it's it's a massive transformation. And when we're, we're able to inject four sort of top five picks um, in that time also, it, it's, it's a massive transformation. So look, I think most North Melbourne fans are feeling quite optimistic to start the year. And we know that last year was a fantastic start to the year. We were off to a great start. We had two wins. We we're feeling on top of the world. And... I was feeling that after the Collingwood win, or at least I was feeling optimistic. After watching the GWS Collingwood game on the weekend, it did make me go, gee, <laughs> um, round one could be ugly. And look, I go in optimistically, but I go in with low low expectations. And I, I think that we as North fans need to really temper our expectations for round one. I think round two against Fremantle is a fantastic opportunity to test ourselves against opposition that's you know in our ballpark but not well ahead um but we have to remember that the giants um were a point off a grand final last year they're going to be coming off pretty thoroughly beating uh the pies in round one or round zero sorry opening round um so they're going to be a formidable opposition i think and their their forward line and midfield in particular i think is going to give us a lot of trouble now, that's probably underselling some of their fantastic defenders, but I, I think their small forwards we know are, have historically been, trouble, been a problem for us. Toby Green, I'm expecting, is going to have a fantastic game. I don't know who picks him up, whether it's Josh Goda, who I think is probably not quite quick enough and agile enough, or if you put someone like Sheasel or Fisher on him, and that's got to impact their capacity to attack look I don't actually know I don't envy the North Melbourne um, coaching staff for having to make a decision like that um, but yeah I, I do think we have to take a longer term view we have a really tough start to the year so I hope that we are able to stay positive and we're able to win a game or two early and um, you know sort of build a little bit of momentum but I also think we need to remember that it's a long year and there's 23 games and if we, you know, get put away early by a couple of sides, it's not the end of the world. It's going to suck. It's going to be deflating. But I do think that the Giants are a better side than us. I think that's a pretty um, conservative thing to say. <laughs> and, um, you know, all we, we need to look for those positive signs and those things that, um, you know, are going to show us some development. And hopefully we are able to play a bit of North Ball and, and kick a score at least. Um so, yeah, that's my, my pitch to us as North Melbourne fans. Obviously, do as you please. Be as confident or as um, optimistic or as negative as you please. Um, but, yeah, I think we go into round one with a side that I think should be competitive on paper. Um, and, yeah, I think super, just super pumped for the season to start. As I said, it's it's been a long build-up, so... I'm really looking forward to the season getting underway and the uh, the regular podcasting schedule um, to start. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for making it to the end of this episode. Um, and also, welcome. Welcome to the start of the season proper. Um, I've mentioned a couple of times that we've got a big year ahead, a couple of changes to the podcast, but by and large, it's just bigger, better, and um, more exciting and hopefully the boys can win a couple more games um, this year because we know that I only started podcasting 
uh, in round four last year. So I did miss 66% of our wins last year. <laughs> um, so hoping that uh, we can react to a couple more wins this year. And like I said last podcast, just build this North Pod community um, organically as the year goes on. I hope you have a wonderful week. Um, and yeah, I hope that we all enjoy watching some fantastic North Ball on Saturday. We're going to dominate the Giants. Should be a 10-goal win. Um, put your house on it. And uh, um, that's not financial advice. I will speak to you sometime pretty shortly after the GWS game. Go North! Thanks for listening to another episode of North Pod. If you give me a rating or review on your podcast service, that would be much appreciated. And please follow me on all social media at North Pod Show. I'm on X or Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, TikTok, and I'm also very active on the North Melbourne subreddit. Hope you'll join me for the next episode.